Without, the night was cold and wet. But in the small parlor of Laburnum Villa, the blinds were drawn and the fire burned brightly. Father and son were at chess. The former, who possessed ideas about the game involving radical chances, putting his king into such sharp and unnecessary perils that it even provoked comment from the fair-haired lady knitting placidly by the fire. Talk at the wind, said Mr. White, who, having seen a fatal mistake after it was too late, was amiably desirous of preventing his son from seeing it. I'm listening, said the latter, grimly surveying the board as he stretched out his hand. Check. I should hardly think he'd come tonight, said his father, with his hand poised over the board. Mate, replied the son. That's the worst of living so far out. Of all the beastly slush you have of the way places to live in, this is the worst. Paths are bog and the roads are torrent. I don't know what people are thinking about. I suppose because only two houses and the road are let, they think it doesn't matter. Never mind, dear. Perhaps you'll win the next one. Mr. White looked up sharply, just in time to intercept a knowing glance between mother and son. The words died away on his lips, and he hid a guilty grin in his thin gray beard. There he is, said Herbert White, as the gate banged too loudly and heavy footsteps came toward the door. The father rose with hospitable haste, and opening the door, was heard condoling with the new arrival. The new arrival also condoled with himself, so that Mrs. White said, Tut, tut! and coughed gently as her husband entered the room, followed by a tall, burly man, beady of eye and rubicund of visage. Sergeant Major Morris, <laughs> he said, introducing him. The Sergeant Major took hands and, taking the proffered seat by the fire, watched contentedly as his host got out whiskey and tumblers and stood a small copper kettle on the fire. At the third glass, his eyes got brighter, and he began to talk. The little family circle regarding with eager interest this visitor from distant parts, as he squared his broad shoulders in the chair and spoke of wild scenes and doughty deeds, of wars and plagues and strange peoples. Twenty-one years of it. When he went away, he was a slip of a youth in the warehouse. Now look at him. He don't look to have taken much harm. I'd like to go to India myself, just to look around a bit, you know. Better where you are, said the sergeant major, shaking his head. He put down the empty glass and, sighing softly, shook it again. I should like to see those old temples and fakirs and jugglers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What was that you started telling me the other day about a monkey's hmm? paw or something, Morris? Uh, nothing. Leastways, nothing worth hearing. Monkey's paw? Well, it's just a bit of what you might call magic, perhaps. His three listeners leaned forward eagerly. The visitor absent-mindedly put his empty glass to his lips and then set it down again. His host filled it for him again. To look at said the sergeant major, fumbling in his pocket. It's just an ordinary little paw, dried to a mummy. He took something out of his pocket and proffered it. Mrs. White drew back with a grimace, oh. but her son, taking it, examined it curiously. And what is it special about it? Oh, it had a spell put on it by an old fakir, a very holy man. He wanted to show that fate ruled people's lives, and that those who interfered with it did so to their sorrow. He put a spell on it so that three separate men could each have three wishes from it. His manners were so impressive that his hearers were conscious that their light laughter had jarred somewhat. Well, why don't you have three, sir? The soldier regarded him the way that middle ages want to regard presumptuous youth. I have he said quietly, and his blotchy face whitened. And did you really have the three wishes granted? <clears throat> I did, said the sergeant major, and his glass tapped against his strong teeth. What did you wish for? And has anybody else wished? Uh, first man had his three wishes yet. I don't know what the first two were, but the third was for death. That's how I got the paw. Yet, you appear unharmed. If you've had your three wishes, mm. it's no good to you now, then, Morris. What do you keep it for? 
fancy, I suppose. I did have some idea of selling it, but I don't think I will. It has caused me enough mischief already. Besides, people won't buy. They think it's a fairy tale, some of them. And those who do think anything of it want to try it first and pay me afterward. If you could have another three wishes, would you have them? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. He took the paw and dangling it between his forefinger and thumb, suddenly threw it upon the fire. No! White stooped down and snatched it off. Better let it burn. If you don't want it, Morris, give it to me. I won't. I threw it on the fire. If you keep it, don't blame me for what happens. Pitch it on the fire like a sensible man. The other shook his head and examined his possession closely. How do you do it? Hold it up in your right hand and wish aloud. But I warn you of the consequences. Don't you think you might wish for four pairs of hands for me? Said Mrs. White as she rose and began to set the supper. Her husband drew the talisman from his pocket and all three I burst into wish. laughter as the sergeant major, <laughs> with a look of alarm on his face, caught him by the arm. If you must wish, wish for something sensible. Mr. White dropped it back in his pocket and, placing chairs, motioned his friend to the table. In the business of supper, the talisman was partly forgotten, and afterward the three sat listening in an enthralled fashion to a second installment of the soldier's adventures in India. If the tale about the monkey's paw is not more truthful than those he has been telling us, said Herbert, as the door closed behind their guest, just in time to catch the last train. We shan't make much of it. Did you give anything for it, Father? inquired Mrs. White, regarding her husband closely. A trifle, said he, coloring slightly. He didn't want it, but I made him take it. And he pressed me again to throw it away. Likely. Why, we're going to be rich and famous and happy. Wish... To be an emperor, father, to begin with. Then you can't be hen pecked. Oh, you miserable child. He darted round the table, pursued by the maligned Mrs. White armed with a tablecloth. Mr. White took the paw from his pocket and eyed it dubiously. I don't know what to wish for. And that's a fact. Seems to me I've got all I want. Well, if you only cleared the house, you'd be quite happy, wouldn't you? Well... Wish for two hundred pounds, then. That'll just do it. His father, smiling shamefacedly at his own credulity, held up the talisman as his son, with a solemn face, somewhat marred by a wink at his mother, sat down and struck a few impressive chords. I wish for two hundred pounds. Oh! It moved! He cried with a glance of disgust at the object as it lay on the floor. As I wished, it twisted in my hand like a snake. Well, I don't see the money, said his son, as he picked it up and placed it on the table. And I bet I never shall. It must have been your fancy, Father. Oh. Never mind, no, there's no harm done. But it gave me a shock all the same. They sat down by the fire again while the two men finished their pipes. Outside, the wind was higher than ever, and Mr. White started nervously at the sound of a door banging upstairs. A silence unusual and depressing settled on all three, which lasted until the husband and wife rose to retire for the rest of the night. I expect you find the cash tied up in a big bag in the middle of your bed, said Herbert as he bade them good night. And something horrible squatting on top of your wardrobe, watching you as you pocket your real gotten gains. Herbert sat alone in the darkness, gazing at the dying fire and seeing faces in it. The last was so horrible and so simian that he gazed at it in amazement. It got so vivid, with a little uneasy laugh, he felt on the table for a glass containing a little water to throw over it. His hand grasped the monkey's paw, and, with a little shiver, he wiped his hand on his coat and 
went up to bed. In the brightness of the wintry sun next morning as it streamed over the breakfast table, he laughed at his fears. There was an air of prosaic wholesomeness about the room which it had lacked on the previous night, and the dirty, shriveled little paw was pitched on the sideboard with a carelessness which betokened no great belief in its virtues. I suppose all old soldiers are the same. The idea of our listening to such nonsense... How could wishes be granted in these days? And if they could, how could two hundred pounds hurt you, Father? Might drop on his head from the sky, <laughs> said the frivolous Herbert. Morris said the things happened so naturally that you might, if you so wished, attribute it to coincidence. Well, don't break into the money before I come back, said Herbert as he rose from the table. I'm afraid it'll turn you into a mean, avaricious man, and we shall have to disown you. His mother laughed and, following him to the door, watched him down the road, and, returning to the breakfast table, was very happy at the expense of her husband's credulity, all of which did not prevent her from scurrying to the door at the postman's knock, nor prevent her from referring somewhat shortly to retired sergeant majors of bibulous habits when she found that the post brought a tailor's bill. Herbert will have some more of his funny remarks, I expect, when he comes home, she said as they sat at dinner. I dare say, said Mr. White, pouring himself out some beer. But for all that, the thing moved in my hand. That I'll swear to. You thought it did. I say it did. There was no thought about it. I had just... What's the matter? His wife made no reply. She was watching the mysterious movements of a man outside who, peering in an undecided fashion at the house, appeared to be trying to make up his mind to enter. In mental connection with the two hundred pounds, she noticed that the stranger was well-dressed and wore a silk hat of glossy newness. Three times he paused at the gate and then walked on again. The fourth time he stood with his hand upon it, and then, with sudden resolution, flung it open and walked up the path. Mrs. White, at the same moment, placed her hands behind her, and, hurriedly unfastening the strings of her apron, put that useful article of apparel beneath the cushion of her chair. She brought the stranger, who seemed ill at ease, into the room. He gazed at her furtively and listened in a preoccupied fashion as the lady of the house apologized for the appearance of the room and her husband's coat, a garment which he usually reserved for the garden. She then waited, as patiently as her sex would permit, for him to broach his business, but he was at first strangely silent. I... W I was asked to call, he said at last, and stooped and picked a piece of cotton from his trousers. I come from Maw and Megan's. Is anything the matter? Has anything happened to Herbert? What is it? What is it? There, there, Mother, sit down. And don't jump to conclusions. You've not brought bad news, I'm sure, sir. I'm sorry. Is he hurt? Badly hurt. But he is not in any pain. Oh, thank God. Oh, thank God for that. Thank God. She broke off as the sinister meaning of the assurance dawned on her, and she saw the awful confirmation of her fears in the other's averted face. She caught her breath, and turning to her slower-witted husband, laid her trembling hand on his. There was a long silence. He was caught in the machinery. Caught in the machinery. Yes. He sat staring out the window, and taking his wife's hand between his own, pressed it as he had been wont to do in their old courting days nearly thirty years before. He was the only one left to us. It is hard. The other coughed and, rising, <coughs> walked slowly to the window. The firm wishes me to convey their sincere sympathy with you in your great loss, I beg you that you will understand I am only their servant in merely obeying orders. There was no reply. The mother's face was white, her eyes staring, and her breath inaudible. <laughs>
On the father's face was a look such as his friend the sergeant might have carried into his first action. I was to say that Moore and Meggins disclaim all responsibility. They admit no liability at all. Your son, it seems, erred in judgment and stepped within too close a proximity and was caught. But in consideration of your son's services, they wish to present you with a, a certain sum as compensation. Mr. White dropped his wife's hand and, rising to his feet, gazed with a look of horror at his visitor. His dry lips shaped the words, How much? Two hundred pounds, was the answer. Unconscious of his wife's shriek, Mr. White smiled faintly, put out his hands like a sightless man, and dropped a senseless heap to the floor. In the huge new cemetery, some two miles distant, the old people buried their dead and came back to the house steeped in shadows and silence. It was all over so quickly that at first they could hardly realize it and remained in a state of expectation as though of something else to happen, something else which was to lighten this load, too heavy for old hearts to bear. But the days passed and expectations gave way to resignation, the hopeless resignation of the old, sometimes miscalled apathy. Sometimes they hardly exchanged a word, for now they had nothing to talk about, and their days were long to weariness. It was about a week after that that the old man, waking suddenly in the night, stretched out his hand and found himself alone, the room was in darkness, and the sound of subdued weeping came from the window. He raised himself in bed and listened. Come back. It'll be cold. It's colder for my son. The sounds of her sobs died away on his ears. The bed was warm, and his eyes heavy with sleep. He dozed fitfully and then slept until a sudden wild cry from his wife awoke him with a start. The paw? The monkey's paw? Where, where, where is it? What's the matter? I want it. You've not destroyed it. It's in the parlor on the bracket. Why? I've only just thought of it. Why didn't I think of it before? Why didn't you think of it? Think of what? The other two wishes. We've only had one. Was not that enough? No. We'll have one more. Go down and get it quickly. And wish our boy alive again. Good God, you're mad! Get it. Get it quickly and wish. Oh, my boy, my boy. Get back to bed. You don't know what you're saying. We've had the first wish granted. Why not the second? A coincidence. Go get it and wish! He has been dead ten days. And besides, he... I would not tell you else, but... I could only recognize him by his clothing. If he was too terrible for you to see then, how now? Bring him back. Do you think I fear the child I have nursed? He went down in the darkness and felt his way to the parlor and then to the mantelpiece. The talisman was in its place and a horrible fear that the unspoken wish might bring his mutilated son before him ere he could escape from the room seized up on him, and he caught his breath as he found that he had lost the direction of the door. His brow cold with sweat, he felt his way round the table and groped along the wall until he found himself in the small passage with the unwholesome thing in his hand. Even his wife's face seemed changed as he entered the room. It was white and expectant, and to his fears seemed to have an unnatural look upon it. He was afraid of her. Wish! It is foolish and wicked. Wish! He raised his hand. I 
wish my son alive again. The talisman fell to the floor, and he regarded it fearfully. Then he sank trembling into a chair as the old woman, with burning eyes, walked to the window and raised the blind. He sat until he was chilled with the cold, glancing occasionally at the figure of the old woman peering through the window. The candle end, which had burned below the rim of the china candlestick, was throwing pulsating shadows on the ceiling and walls, until, with a flicker larger than the rest, it expired. The old man, with an unspeakable. Unspeakable sense of relief at the failure of the talisman, crept back to his bed, and a minute afterward the old woman came silently and apathetically beside him. Neither spoke, but lay silently listening to the ticking of the clock. A stair creaked, and a squeaky mouse scurried noisily through the wall. The darkness was oppressive, and after lying for some time, screwing up his courage, he took the box of matches, and striking one, went downstairs for a candle. At the foot of the stairs, the match went out, and he paused to strike another. And at the same moment, a knock came so quietly and stealthily as to be scarcely audible. Sounded on the front door. The matches fell from his hand and spilled in the passage. He stood motionless, his breath suspended until the knock was repeated. Then he turned and fled swiftly back to his room and closed the door behind him. A third knock sounded through the house. What's that? A rat. A rat. Pass me on the stairs. His wife sat up in bed listening. A loud knock resounded through the house. It's Herbert. She ran to the door, but her husband was before her, and catching her by the arm, held her tightly. What are you going to do? It's my boy. It's Herbert. I forgot he was two miles away. What are you holding me for? Let go! I must open the door. For God's sake, don't let it in! You're afraid of your own son. Let me go! I'm coming, Herbert. I'm coming. There was another knock, and another. The old woman, with a sudden wrench, broke free and ran from the room. Her husband followed to the landing and called after her appealingly as she hurried downstairs. He heard the chain rattle back and the bolt draw slowly and stiffly from the socket. Then the old woman's voice, strained and panting, "The bolt! Come down! I can't reach it!" But her husband was on his hands and knees, groping wildly on the floor in search of the paw. If only he could find it before the thing outside got in. A perfect fusillade of knocks reverberated through the house, and he heard the scraping of a chair as his wife put it down in the passage against the door. He heard the creaking of the bolt as it came slowly back, and at the same moment he found the monkey's paw and frantically breathed his third and last wish. I wish my son dead again. The knocking ceased suddenly. Although the echoes of it were still in the house, he heard the chair drawn back, and the door opened. A cold wind rushed up the staircase, and a long, loud wail of disappointment and misery from his wife gave him the courage to run down to her side, and then to the gate beyond. The street lamp 